Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this good time that you give us to rest and to have fellowship and to learn and to just um, worship and sit at your feet. I just pray you be with us now. You inspire us. You give us your heart and your wisdom and your understanding as to what you'd have to say to us, Lord. We thank you for all the things that you've put before us today, and we pray that you continue to do more in all of the teachers and all of the, the word and the workshops and just go before our, our time this afternoon in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. How's everyone doing? So let's take a survey. Uh, who came from up north? Raise your hand. Where'd you come from? Taos. Taos. Awesome. Who came from down south? Where'd you come from? Silver City. Silver City. Okay. Uh, who's from Albuquerque? Raise your hand. Two, three, four people. Great. And all the rest of you guys, anybody from anywhere else? Rio Rancho. Rio Rancho, Roswell. Farmington. Awesome. So, so somebody said Moriarty. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're glad that you guys are here. Are you from Moriarty too? Awesome. So glad that you guys are here. I hope you're enjoying your day. Um, so I, I told Ray, <laughs> it's funny because um, every year um, I have a teaching and it says women's ministry. And I told him, you know, it doesn't always have to just be women's ministry. It's encouraging women. Because actually that's what the women's ministry is. <laughs> just encouraging women. It's not just encouraging women. It's really important. And if you look around in the church, there's a lot of women. <laughs> and women who come with their kids, uh, with their husband, without a husband, um, grandmas, um, all different single ladies. Um, but thankfully, God's word is universal, and it applies to all of our lives. Before I get started, is there anybody that has like a particular uh, concept or idea about women's ministry that, that you have a question about or that you're leaning toward? Are there any uh, of those thoughts that you're like, oh, I really want to ask this question? And I want to do that before I get started. Nobody. Okay, maybe after you think of some, you'll think of something. But um, um, so let's open our Bibles to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Are there any leaders of women's ministry here? Raise your hand. One. Okay. Are there any of, okay. All right. That's, that's good to know. So, has, how about this? Have, have any of you come to the women's ministry workshop before? No? Okay. What, raise your hand if you have. One, two, three, four. Okay. All right. Not as many as you, though. Okay. So, women's ministry is a great place for women to come together and make friends and to be supported and to be encouraged. It's really hard for women who aren't, uh, who are new to a fellowship or who don't know people to go to women's ministry. It's really hard because you feel like, uh, like you stick out like a sore thumb. You don't know anybody and it's just very awkward for someone who comes for the first time. And um, so just a little brief uh, philosophy of ministry uh, of what I've learned and what I've hoped that we're achieving in women's ministry is that the women's ministry is a place to support women and give you practical application to how to minister to women. It's not, um, we're not theologians. We're not, we don't study the Greek and the Hebrew however we do reference it. We are part of the church that teaches practical application. And so, as in every ministry of our church, we hold God's word 
as preeminent. We hold asking the Holy Spirit to come and to inspire us and to fill us. But also, we encourage women to feel safe with each other and to ask questions, but also to share their struggles. So in order for that to happen, women have to feel loved. So like the most important aspect of women's ministry is loving the women. And as I was taught through Pastor Chuck's wife, Kay, the, our, my, our most important goal in ministering to women is that, first of all, you love God. And then you love your family, your husband first, your kids, and that you love others in the church. And when you're doing those things in women's ministry, then women will feel loved. Um, one of the big problems that a lot of women have ministering to other women is that sometimes we're so consumed in our own problems that we can't see past our face. And so that's why God wants us to be healthy. And that not that we're not going to have problems, but that those problems don't become the thing that's in front of us like a cataract. Does anybody have a cataract or a bad one? I have one, but it doesn't bug me. <laughs> Apparently, I have one, they tell me. But some people have cataracts so bad that they see, I guess it's like a fogginess. And especially at night, I think, um, the lights really, um, like, they're glary. And you have cataracts at night, like when you're driving. I tell my husband, you see that car out there? I don't just see the lights. I see lines coming from those lights. So that's how I go, OK, maybe I do have them. But, um, so being healthy yourself as a woman and doing the things that God would want you to do, read your Bible, pray, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, go to church, be a part of a church, participate. This is the Servant Leaders Conference, giving to others. Um, God doesn't want couch potatoes. However, there's times when you are one for whatever reason. You have a baby, you're sick, you're taking care of somebody who's sick, you know, whatever it is, there's those seasons. But for you to be healthy, you have to do all the things God wants you to do. And for you to be able to give that love that God has, you have to be uh, obedient to him in your life. And it's so important. Or you, one, don't have anything to give. Or two, you don't see the needs of other people. And so um, we're just going to go through uh, this psalm. And I really think that there's some simple things that, as women, that, that we need to be reminded about when, whether we're serving in the ministry or we're thinking about serving in the ministry, or um, we uh, have been hurt by something in the ministry. And so we're going to read Psalm 92, and then we'll go through it. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, with harmonious sounds, for you, O Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that, that, it is that they may be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. 
the first thing I see about this psalm is that we should be thankful. You know, it's it's really easy to complain, right? I mean, gosh, I can just complain about everything. This morning, I told my husband, why does morning have to come so early? <laughs> I'm not a morning person. 10 o'clock, I'm okay, I'm awake. But before that, mm -mm, no. And even if I get a lot of sleep, still. I'm just not, never been a um, little morning sunshine person. But we should be thankful. We should start every day thankful. Get up in the morning. Thank you, God, for this morning. Think, think of things. You can think of things. Thank you, God, for my kids that don't live by me anymore. You know, whatever. You know, thankful for whatever. Be thankful. Be thankful for the things that you have, the simple things. Thank you. I have a house. When you, you know what? I never are more, I'm never more thankful than when I come back from a mission trip. Oh, Lord, when we used to go to Peru and Colombia, thank you, God, for carpet. I don't even have carpet in my house anymore. But I used to say, thank you, God, for running water, hot water. Thank you, God, that I have screens in my house. Thank you, God, that I don't have to worry about the food I'm going to eat because it's safe. Being thankful for those things that you forget about. I have to remind myself, thank you, God, for blue skies. I called my daughter the other day. She moved to Phoenix. She's, and I was at her house. She says, Mom, show me the sky. Because in Phoenix, everything's everywhere, right? Show me the mountain. And she's like, oh, I miss that. You know, be thankful, especially when you're crabby. Thank God in the morning for the thing that he's given you, to declare your loving kindness in the morning. And it says, and verse 2 and 3, and your faithfulness every night. At night. Whew. I don't know about you. I don't know, maybe, if it's just the time of the year or if I'm just getting older. But at night, I'm like, thank you, God, for my bed. That is the really the number one reason I make it about to make my bed every day. Because I want to come home to my bed made. Thank you, God, for my bed. You know, thank you for my pillows. I, you literally, be thankful at night. You know, it's easy at the end of the day to go, oh, you know. But be thankful for the things that happen. Um, it says, in your faithfulness every night. And then it talks about music on an instrument of 10 strings on the, on the, on the harp with harmonious sound. So I guess that's just saying how to be thankful. He, he was a psalmist, so he did it. It was a song. This says that this is a song for the Sabbath day. So it's also a time of reflection. The Sabbath was the day to take and set aside a time of reflection and a time of nothingness and not doing the things you normally do. And then it says, praise, um, I guess this was just something I wrote down. Praise to the Lord for his love and his faithfulness. Every day is a new day. So verses, um, um, so I put not only to be thankful, but when things go wrong, trust him and not what you see. We're fixers. I'm in obsessively OCD, I don't know. Um, things have to be a certain way for me. Like, I'm weird, like there's certain things that, no, I can't do this until I do this. Like, I'm just weird that way. Uh, but being thankful and trusting that even if things don't go right, God knows the reason. I think sometimes when things go wrong, we panic. Ah, oh, how can we fix this thing? And it's really hard in the moment of panic not to realize that you're just in a moment. You're in a moment that's not going to last forever. I could think of that and relate it mostly to like when one of my kids did something wrong, like bad, like when they were teenagers or even adults. And I just felt like when they did that thing, it was never going to change. It was always going to be that way. And I had to tell myself, God told me, chill out, man. 
This is just a moment working together for a good thing. For it to have its work, there's going to have to be pain. There's going to have to be uh, what you would consider chaos. Not saying that God works in chaos, but God fixes things. And sometimes for things to be in order, they're out of order. Because sin has, has um, outcomes. It has consequences. Sin brings death. It brings destruction. It brings separation. It brings um, unhealthiness. It brings bad choices. Therefore, there's those moments where you have to realize this is not forever, you know? And, and, and instead of panicking about it, trusting that God is going to work through this and crying out to God, please, God, work through this and praying and asking him to intervene. So when things go wrong, don't trust in what you see. I'm constantly telling moms who have kids who are just doing whatever they want to do, trust me, every day that kid gets up, and he's miserable. He might not be miserable or look miserable, but he or she is living with the decisions that they've made, and they hear that mama voice. They know. Call them. Talk to them. Tell them the things you think they don't want to hear with love. And let them know you're praying for them. Let them know you're with them, that you're thinking about them, that if they need anything, they can call you or come to you. They might not be doing the right things, but that doesn't mean you stop being the mom, the mother, the woman in their life. This applies to anybody that is your friend that you know that is going through or in a state of rebellion. Don't forget about them. Don't think, oh, they don't want to hear from me. Ugh, they're just going to get convicted. Ooh, they're going to be mad at me. Do everything in love. Because God's love and God's word is powerful. It says God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. So don't stop doing the things that you need to do in times of stress or worry. Keep being what God wants you to be. Because God is good. Okay, also it says in verse 4, uh, for you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the work of your hands. Oh, Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. So that makes me think I need to worship God every day. I need to have worship and prayerfulness in my heart towards him. And, and, and why does God need to tell himself he's great? He doesn't. He's reminding us. He's great. He's good. His thoughts are very deep. You know, like, there's certain people who are very good at pinpointing thoughts. And when they say things, you're like, oh, that makes so much sense. They articulate their thoughts very orderly. And there's a concept that you never thought was something. And then when they put it together, you're like, oh, that makes sense. God's thoughts are deeper than that. He's so deep. His thoughts, but not only are his thoughts deep, his thoughts are deep toward you. See, we just think about, okay, I just ate lunch, I'm sitting here at a conference, sure could use some coffee, I don't know. I have to do this after, or what am I doing next, or what? We're like that. But God's thoughts are deep. He thinks, it says that he thought about you when you were in your mother's womb. I mean, it's really hard for us to understand the concept of how God's thoughts are so deep because our mind is not that deep. <laughs> Even though we're made in the image and the likeness of God, can you imagine how smart God is? How in the world does he hold the world together? Or even that he thinks or that he tells you things, that he talks to you, that he has thoughts toward you? His thoughts are deep, so we need to worship him for that. And also... It's his work. It's not your work to fix yourself. I think a lot of people think, I gotta get better. I got, okay, what you need to think is, I gotta obey. Just obey him in the little things. It's his work. He says we're his 
poema, his poem, his workmanship. It's his work, not your work. It's not your husband's work, your boss's work, your friend's work. It's his work. You just be obedient to him because he knows every detail of your life. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what happened yesterday. He knows what's going to happen in 10 days or five years or whatever. The biggest thing about not being a Christian that I think I suffered with was not knowing what my future was, not knowing what decisions to make, not knowing what the right way for my life to go was. For me, that was like, you know, I didn't know things. And I knew that I didn't want to make a move until God told me what to do. But once I became a Christian, I realized that God was in control of my life. All I needed to do was be obedient to him and listen to him tell me what to do. And sometimes that's really hard to do because we want to make decisions based on our own knowledge. And we want to make decisions based on logical things or what other people think. But especially when you're within dealing with women or even ministering to your husband or your kids, we have to understand is that is that um, is that the way that we should go is the way that God would prod us to do. So you know, like, like even like for me, like you know, uh, should I do this or should I do that? Should I go here or should I not go there? Should I go to this meeting or that meeting? I mean, I really like have to say, okay, God, do you want me to do this? And then God will just orchestrate my day where I'm like, nope, I can't do that, or whatever. But like depending on him to help you to make the right decisions, even as far as for your families, like, oh, should I be, you know, how should I, you know, minister to the, my family in this way, you know, but I have this responsibility, but I have that responsibility. And not letting your flesh, your emotions, your friends, your feelings, uh, popular thought decide which way you should do things because um, there's things that happen that make us choose uh, emotional choices like you know the particular circumstance that you're in well this happened so now I have to make this change in my life that doesn't matter God knows you never have to be worried that God doesn't care about you especially when you're in a circumstance that is overwhelming or maybe you did something wrong or you made a mistake like a failure God still can take that failure and make it into something good um, maybe God is changing your life around and he's making you grow a certain way well that's not fun but just like when a baby's being born that's very painful but good things come from pain and so um, you know if whatever direction God has your life going, you need to trust that he's in control because he's greater than any of your difficulties, right? He's greater and wiser, and he can orchestrate your life for good. So we're on verse 6. Um, oh, Lord, uh, a senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. See, the psalmist is comparing the wicked people to like weeds. They're everywhere, you know. Uh, past, I don't know, last week, I was like, ugh, there's wickedness everywhere. Think about all the things that are happening in the world. Think about all the bad people. Um, you think about how the world is orchestrated and just a dumb thing like, do you know that the who wants to be in charge of our country when there's like something bad that happens, like a pandemic or, a, or a, I don't know, anything. They have this charter that they're saying that all the countries that are part of the WHO have to sign this pledge that says that they're going to be in control of us if like there was another pandemic. You're like, what in the world? How could that happen? But like stupid seem like things like that. You know, like, do you know that the governor has on her desk a bill that says that our gas prices are going to rise in 50 cents to help what for is it for like the 
electric vehicle. I don't know what's it for. 50 cents. Our gas prices are going to go up. Doesn't even make sense. They're counting on you using gas and charging you more for it so they can do the green thing. Anyway, sometimes those stupid things have happened. You're like, ugh. Or like, I don't know. We can think of a bunch. I can think of a bunch of stuff. Um, they planted a, in, a chip into a person. And AI wants to take over the world. Uh, somebody said that they went to AI on Google and said, tell me about American history. And it said, and it gave like, it made reference to white people being racist. I was like, what? Who's programming those things? The people who think that every white person is racist? And you just think about all those things happening, you can get bummed out. You know, why do I do this? Why am I doing that? Or even in ministry, you can go like, nobody even cares. Or I, I was kind of mad because I was like, Dan, you took my thunder. When he's talking about criticism, you know, you make mistakes or nobody likes me or whatever. Think of all the things that happen when you serve. You, you rub somebody the wrong way. Somebody rubs you the wrong way. You see something and you're frustrated. Why does that happen in the church? Or whatever. Or somebody doesn't say hi to you right. Or everybody, I'm just telling you people, I'm not from New Mexico, but some of you guys have a way that if people don't say hi to you, you get offended. I saw it sounding like that, that, that girl, Angel, Angelica, you know that comedian? What's her name? Angela Johnson, yeah. Anyway, you get mad because she didn't look at me right. She didn't give me the right hug. You know, oh, come on, people. Hi. You know, everybody, you know, it, it, I'm just, you know why? Because coming from other places, people don't even say hi to you. <laughs> when you go to California or New York, don't you dare look at people in the eyes because they don't want none of it. What do you want? But anyway, but just dumb things that happen when you're in church. Like, I'm in church and somebody did something to me or something or whatever. But God called you. That person didn't call you. God called you to do the things that he's telling you to do. And so because he called you, look to him. Don't go to your, don't go to anybody before you go to God. Don't go to your leader. Don't go to your pastor. Don't go to your friends for sure. Go to God and say, God, help me out here. How, why did this happen? Okay, so I've had difficulties in ministry. I've been in ministry for, I don't know, 30-something years. And of course I've had difficulties with certain things or people or situations. And you know what God just showed me? Trust me. What I do when I'm so frustrated with something and nobody sees the something that I see, I just like cry out to God. And I'm frustrated or I'm mad and I'll just say, God, your word says this and your word says that. Then how can this be like this? How can be this be like that? And then lately I've been writing the scripture down that God gives me in my Bible. And I put a date by it. And then when God comes, because I have cried out loud, why don't you do something, God? And then I go back and I look at that and I go, oh, there it is. And look, he did it. But it's not me and the world. See what I'm saying? It's me and God. Because he's the one who sees and who knows everything. And besides, he's the only one who can fix problems. Everybody has problems. Every family has problems. Every church has problems. Every work has problems. Everybody has problems. And so go to God. He'll take care of them. And sometimes what God does is say, get over that. That's not a big deal. Stop it. Stop caring about that one thing that always bugs you. Stop it. And God will just say, stop it. And then you could say yes, or you can keep complaining about it. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I think it was Ray that was talking about the apostles and about how did they really not understand who Jesus was and that they would say things to him. They're like, you dummy. You know, like remember the Three Stooges? How they used to go and hit themselves? It's like, ugh, how could you be so dumb? 
Well, because we be think that we're something better than we're not. And we have to listen to God when he, when we have problems. When things go wrong, don't focus on the problem, focus on him. Because I am such a, I'm a person who, like, maybe not when things go wrong, but like when things happen sometimes, I get so frustrated. It's like the stupidest thing. I think I'm the only person in the world who unties her own shoe like 10 times a day. So like I'll have tennis shoes on and I literally will untie my shoe like 10 times. Oh, I'm so frustrated, my stupid shoe won't say die. Like those kind of things like frustrate me. That's so dumb, right? But you know, there's certain things that happen that we just have to say, okay God, you're in control. We have to focus on him because he is greater and he is stronger. And he sees the wicked. He knows they're like weeds. And, you know, they do flourish sometimes. You know, they do, things, bad things do happen. Okay, so like um, Roe versus Wade, right? It's gone. But guess what? <coughs> now New Mexico is the abortion capital of the U.S. Because our governor is like, has open arms to them. And everybody's coming over here to get them. But we can pray for them. We can join the pro-life people. We can help them. We can go. There's people who go to the clinics in Albuquerque. And they have had girls. Uh, somebody told me a story. I don't think they told me. But I was in a group with a bunch of women. And they were talking about how they were ministering at the Southwest place. And they have this van. And they go over there and they have all this stuff in the van. And they, 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 they before the girls go in, they, they try to pray, can we pray for you? And this one girl, she went in and they prayed for her and they talked to her and then she still went to go do it and she got up off the table and came running out and said, I'm not gonna do that. And they ministered to her and they helped her and they did all these things. And, um, but you know, how many babies die every day? But you know what, focus on what you can do and let God worry about those weeds because there's too many weeds for all of us to think that we can take care of all the problems of the world. We can. And God didn't make us to do that. You know, it's, this is God's creation. You know, he created it. We can do our part, but it's not our, we're, we're, not, gonna, we're not gonna save the world. God is. Um, a lot of times, um, I, uh, I try to uh, share with people about, uh, because I'm a part of an organization called Concerned Women for America. So I try to share with people the things that are happening in our country, in our world. And a lot of things people don't even know that is happening. And I'm like, did you know, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know. I could think of something right now, but I can't. Um, but um, I know what it was. There was a man who got interviewed the other day, and he was from the Border Patrol. Did anybody hear this? And they asked him, and they said, do you know that every child that comes in with a person is that family member of that child? They said, no. We used to have a law that Biden erased that said that we had to do DNA testing. So when a man or somebody came in with a child, they would DNA test both of them. And if they had no relation, see how they can find those things out fast? They wouldn't let that child go with them. But now, they abolished that law. So the Border Patrol guy said, we are promoting sex slavery and child trafficking. It's horrible. The Border Patrol guy, somebody said who was interviewing him, have you ever told anybody this? Because nobody's asked. And so like, I'm a part of that organization, so we talk about those things and we encourage each other because um, I think that we, but we pray. But sometimes we can be overwhelmed with the wickedness of the world. But we have to understand that God is in control and um, they're his battles, not ours. So um, did I read verse six and seven? Okay, verse eight. But you, O Lord, are on high forevermore. Um, God is great, and he's forever, and he's to all eternity. And it says, behold, your enemy shall perish. That's 
They will. They shall perish. And they shall be scattered. But it says in verse 10, but my horn, and I had a little thing on my Bible that said that word horn means strength. I was thinking animals, and I went, no, 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 that means strength. Because it says you have, you have exalted like a wild ox. Now, I've never met a wild ox, so I don't really know what that means. But my strength, I guess, is what it means. It's like the biggest animal you can think of. I don't know. And then it says, I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eyes also have seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire in the wicked who rise up against me. Stay close to God. Obey him and he will preserve you. See, we need to turn to the Lord for everything, for all of our problems. He's the only one that can preserve us. And the psalmist knows that because he's drawn close to God and he knows who he is. And he says, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Now, you think about a palm tree, you think about why do palm trees only grow in certain weather? What kind of weather do palm trees grow in? Beautiful blue skies, ocean breeze, right? California. They do grow a little bit in Las Cruces. My sister had a little palm tree in her yard that grew only so high. But, huh? Panama. Panama, yeah. It's hot there. But also in tropical places where people go to vacation, right? Florida, you know, Bahamas, wherever. Palm trees are only flourish under the right conditions. Just like the righteous will flourish like a palm tree if they're in the right conditions. Do you know what I'm saying? If you're doing the godly things of God. That doesn't mean you don't fail or you don't make mistakes. But it says we shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. So apparently the cedars in Lebanon were famous. I've heard a lot about them in the Bible. Um, we heard a lot about him with Nehemiah when he was uh, looking, or not Nehemiah, I don't know if it was Nehemiah, but other people when they were building the temple and how, uh, I guess they used to float them in the water, bring them to Jerusalem, but like they were a popular, healthy tree. And it says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord fl shall flourish in the courts of our God. Now. What does planted mean? Everybody knows that's simple, right? Put in the ground. Excuse me. Planted in a pot, right? That's where we see that word. Like in soil, planted, like you have roots. So what is the prescription to be flourishing? It's to be planted in the house of the Lord, where there's safety where there's other people around you. I mean, God made the church a place of safety, a place for us to have accountability, a place to learn, a place to grow. Definitely it's a place to eat, right? But also, it's not just a place of trauma where people go running when bad things happen. A lot of people come to our church when bad things happen. Somebody dies in their family. Somebody needs money. They get, get kicked out of their house. Somebody has a fire. Somebody's child or friend is on drugs. They come running to the church and they say, can somebody help me? And we say, naturally, of course. And then some of them, they come, they get help, and they're like, wow, there's a lot of love here. We have funerals. People come, they get ministered to by the bereavement team. They're like, wow, this is awesome. I've never been to a place like this, you know, or whatever. And they stay, you know, uh, people who come and need a food box or something. They know they can come here. They know they can get help. Now, when the people come and they just want the food and they don't want any kind of ministry or any kind of love or any kind of Bible, then they won't come back again because they don't want to have to hear it. 
But when people come back, it's because they know, okay, they're right. I need to hear what they have to say. And they, some of them, can keep coming and keep coming. But it's our responsibility to be a family in the house of God and to be planted. Uh, there's a big problem these days with people hopping around for different things. You know what I'm saying? Like here, I'll go to this for that. I'll go to here for this. Um, sometimes, I'm not picking on anybody, but when there's like a certain musical person at churches on a Sunday, people won't go to church because they're, well, we're gonna go see that person because they're at this church. Do you know what I'm saying? Or like activity-wise, or, or like, oh, well, uh, but you know what? It's just like with your family at home. Nobody wants to compel their family members to come over for Sunday dinner, right? You want them just to come. Oh, I gotta go to my mom's for dinner. Or, oh, I gotta go to church. It's a place where you wanna come because you love to come, because you hear God's word. So, because there's so many options in the world, it's very difficult for Christians to be planted in a church because you can turn on your computer, you can watch Jack Hibbs, you can watch Pastor Raw, you can watch all these teachers and say, oh, I'm gonna stay home on Sunday. But being in a church is what is being planted. Same thing with, with um, your parachurch ministries. There's ministries outside of the church that say, come study with us, because we're smarter, and we'll teach you better and stronger. But when you're with those people, how are you ministering to the people in your own church? How can you say to your friends, Let's, there's sometimes people will come here and say, well, did I go to this church for that, and I go to this church for that, and I go to this church for that. But how can you be a part of a family when you're scattered everywhere? I know that when we first moved here, we were going to church in Albuquerque. But it's really difficult for us to say, oh, we're Christians, go to church with us in Albuquerque, because people lived here in Belen. So as soon as we could, we started having a fellowship here so that we could tell people, yeah, come with us over here. Close by, this is our community. Then when you go and you minister to people, you can say, hey, yeah, it's real close, it's right here. I know some people think Los Linus is so far, <laughs> but like half our church is from Los Linus and half our church is from Belen. And some people even come from Mountain Air. Some people come from Socorro. They come from lots of places. But I think that being a part of your church makes it planted in it is so that you can be supported by the roots and the nourishment that, that is in the ground. See what I'm saying? So when you plant things, the ground is what give it, gives it its nourishment. So like there's other people around you who can help you in a certain area of your life. Um, in the women's ministry right now, we have a good little group of women, but a lot of the women are new. They've never been to our church. And there's a group of our women who started going to the Bible study that Pastor Nathan's doing. And I'm always teasing him, taking my women from my women's ministry. And he's like, sorry. And I'm like, praise the Lord that God is showing these women, hey, I want to go learn about what biblical counseling is. That's pretty awesome. So I don't see it like, oh, there's not a lot of women at the women's ministry. I see it as that God is raising them up to do other things. Maybe they'll come back and be able to minister to the women that are already there. And so it's not about like how big your ministry is, how many people you minister to, or any of that. And I think sometimes we can get discouraged with the outcomes of the people we're ministering to. Maybe like you have a family member or you have a, a group that you meet with and you're like, oh, we're falling apart. No one's coming. You know what? That's not your problem. It's your problem to be there, to share, to love. It's God's problem to do whatever he's going to do. And so um, being planted in the house of the Lord, it's the clear way to flourish. And it says in verse 14, they shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. And that word describes like a green plant. So I got these plants, the, uh, it was a while ago. I got these plants from Costco. And um, I was wanting to have some color in my kitchen. 
And so I bought these three plants, and they're very green. And the thing about them is that they just, oops, sorry, I didn't turn my phone on. They, um, they just provide like this greenness in my kitchen. But I'm fortunate that they're the kind of plants that don't need water all the time. So my problem is that I was overwatering them. So one of them started turning brown because it was getting too much water. It was like, you're drowning me. And then there's another one that the pot is so small that you can only water it for so long and then it dries out but then it gets wilty and I know when it needs watering. So I'm like, uh, I'm probably gonna have to put it in a bigger pot with more soil so that water can sustain it for a longer time because the leaves are, when I'm overwatering it, it's turning brown. But then if I don't water it, it's like literally drooping. So that word, is that God wants us to be like fresh and flourishing. So you know what a plant looks like when it's not flourishing, right? All that to say, it looks droopy, or it looks like, uh, or it just dies. Um, I had a poinsettia from Christmas that I had for a long time, and then one day, it just died. The one next to it is great, but that other plant just died. And I think it's because it was in a smaller pot and the other one has a bigger pot. So like I said, there's more soil to keep it wet. Anyway, that one just died. You don't want to be looking like that, right? All wilted and all, I'm looking to see if someone's in here. Uh, earlier today, somebody told me, you look tired. I said, thank you. <laughs> I was like, I'm not talking about what you look like. I'm talking about ministering to other people. I'm talking about, um, you know, like when somebody cuts the grass. I know that's a hard concept for some of you guys here. But growing up, every on a Saturday morning, when I was asleep, and I would start smelling. First of all, you hear it. My dad mowing the lawn. Ah, oh, that just fresh grass cut smell. So good. Smells so good. That kind of a smell. Well, I'm not saying that God wants you to smell, but that fresh, like a live smell, I don't know. I'm trying to relate it to something else. Is there something else? Maybe like a spring day where the clouds are white and puffy and it's not windy to where it's making you crazy, but it's just like a fresh breeze and you're like, ah, oh, what a great day, right? And that's what God wants us to be like, fresh and flourishing. And, and, and what, what is the reason for all of these things that God wants us to be this way? Is because, verse 15, to declare that the Lord is upright. That's it. Why does God want us to know all these things? So can tell people about him. So people can hear about how good he is and how great he is. And now I don't have anxiety in my life about what I should do. And now I don't have to worry about things that I worry about, but I don't, I can give them to God. So now I can just trust that he sees me and he loves me and he's in control. That I don't have to run around like chicken little, the sky is falling. But I can say, yeah, it is, but don't worry, Jesus is coming through that same sky, right? Um, because in the last verse it says, he is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. He's our rock. He's our, you know what? I don't know about you guys. I have this weird fascination. I hate the cold. No, I like the cold. Okay. I hate summer. I love the winter. Ray is turning into a, I hate the winter person. I tell him, it's so nice. It's so great. It's so cold. Ooh, bring it on. But I have this weird fascination that I think the word hardest, ugliest way to die would be in the cold. I just think it would be horrible. And I have this other fascination with like Mount Everest. You ever see those videos online where they show like, why in the world would somebody go do that? Well, it costs a lot of money. But like it's the tallest, highest place um, in the world. 
So people want to climb it. But it's just this big rock with snow on it and no oxygen. <laughs> it's like, if I climbed Mount Everest, I would die. I would just die. I couldn't do the climb. I couldn't be without the oxygen. I'd be one of those persons they carry down. I, I couldn't do it. And you see people and go, why would somebody do that? Because they have this fascination with like doing hard things. But when you think about like Mount Everest is going to be there, but people, they die. They come, they go, you know, there's litter everywhere. There's even dead bodies there. But God is a rock. He's like greater, stronger, more invincible than that. And there's no unrighteousness in him. He's our rock. There's a scripture that says, um, it's uh, Psalm, I believe it's Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He's the rock. He's higher than I. He's greater. He's strong. You think about that rock. He's our strength. He's sturdy. He can't be moved. He, he's forever. And there's nothing unrighteousness in him. Therefore, why would he forget you? Why would he leave you to your own self? Why would he abandon you? Why would he hate you? Why would he ignore you? He wouldn't do any of those things because he's righteous. So you have to remind yourself, who is God? He's mighty. He's powerful. He's loving. He's kind. He's long-suffering. He's never-ending. His thoughts are always towards me. You have to remind yourself about those things. What happens is, we're too concerned about who we are. And we let that overtake who God is. And we have to put ourselves in the right perspective. He is greater than us. And he is stronger and mightier and powerful. And you, if you don't know that, then you need to look in his word to find all the names of God and who he is. He's our provider. He's the anointed one. He's the, uh, he's the um, Almighty. He's the Father. He's the friend of the fatherless. I mean, he's, he's anything you need him to be. And so you have to stay close to him and obey him. And you have to, that's all. You don't have to, God's not sitting there with a scorebook looking at you and going, hmm, she was only a 3.2 today. <laughs> like okay today was a one point nothing he does not look at you that way and I love that this psalmist is telling you in, in not so many words every day is a new day every day is a try over you know you messed up today tomorrow try better tomorrow look to God tomorrow God can give you a, a new strength some days you're just like i'm so tired you know god give me strength to the next day you know maybe you have a weeks and weeks of being tired it's okay keep going uh i think i think it was dion who was saying don't give up don't surrender keep going and god who is faithful wants to be that faithful one to us he wants to display his love to us but that only happens when we submit. Where is it at? In the book of James. It says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Be humble. Where is that? Four. Thank you. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double 
minded. Lament and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We do thank you for your word, because your word is powerful, and your word is mighty, and your word encourages us, and your word redirects us, and strengthens us, and encourages us, and exhorts us, Lord. And I pray that you would just um, remind us of who you are, God, and focus us, focus us on you and who you are, and help us, God, to be obedient to you, and help us to look to you, and help us to give over all our anxiety, or our desires, or our trauma, or our anything that we have in our heart, God, let us give it to you. And let's not tell you what to do with it, but let's trust that you're going to do the good thing for us. And let us not look to you to do the things that the way we would think that they should be done. But let us trust that you love us and that you'll provide the right things that we need to live our lives, Lord. Help us to let go of the things that have become our idols, Lord, that we think about all the time, that we worry about, that we obsess about, that we're constantly trying to manipulate God. Help us to give those things to you, Lord, and ask you to just give us your hand and your heart and your, your, your love, God, and help us to uh, realize that simply, God, you want us to be the people that we can be flourishing and um, upright so that we can tell people about who you are so that we can declare how good you are and how great you are and that you sent Jesus on the cross to die for our sins because we are sinners every one of us God help us God to remember that life we turned over to you that we submitted ourselves and said we can't do it without you God remind us of those time that time when we did it God that we realize that apart from you we can't do anything God help us to remember that we need you for every little thing yes. give us your peace Lord that peace that passes all understanding Lord help us to remember that Jesus died for the us, for the, our pitiful self, but not because of that, but because he loves us. Lord, and let that be the thing that we share with others, that you did it for us and you could do it for them too. So we thank you for these ladies, Lord. Touch them, encourage them. Lord, if there's things in their life that they need to give back to you, God, please, Lord, I pray they would give them to you. Lord, if there's anxious thoughts or anxious um, situations, Lord, I pray they would release them to you. Uh, their, their children that are backslidden, Lord, or, or their family relationships, or just their fears, or their emotions, whatever they are, God, I pray that we would just give them back to you and ask you to just let us know you're with us and that you would give us the ability to be obedient and faithful and that we be thankful and we remember you every night and every morning, Lord, and that we would be sustained by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.